Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi, and welcome to episode 24 of Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. In this episode, we have lots of things to talk about. We just finished up two of our long-range shooting schools, and we're back in the shop and building rifles. And we want to continue on with our fundamental series. So in this particular series, we're going to be talking about trigger control, some food for thought, and just how important some of the aspects of pulling the trigger properly can be. We also have some exciting news about some changes coming to the shooting school itself and try to talk a little bit about what we're incorporating and answer some questions that are commonly asked here when people call in and ask about the school itself, especially when it comes to equipment. We have some Q&A, so we're going to answer one of our customers' questions that emailed us in. And last but not least, we have a new rifle series that we launched, and it is our carbon fiber series version of our ace and we just finished weighing one up we've got a couple of them on the line so we got some exciting news to share with those as well so without further ado thank you for joining us welcome to the show and here we go so in our last couple podcasts we were working on the fundamentals of marksmanship and talking about piece by piece bit by bit some of the things that we feel are very important and things that make a big difference in marksmanship that play a huge difference when you're shooting at distance. So you'll hear me say a lot, you know, here at the school, when we're at competitions and helping guys out, or guys are asking, you know, favors or or giving pointers, is the only thing you see at the end of the muzzle after you pull the trigger is either the good results of good fundamentals or the poor results of poor fundamentals. And so the heart of the shooting school, especially day one here, is really focusing on that bubble around the shooter, making sure that you do everything correctly. Because you can do one or two things wrong, and when you pull the trigger and the round goes down range, that's where it comes out. And what you see is basically the result of either good fundamentals or bad fundamentals. Continuing on with the series... In this podcast, we're going to talk about trigger control and some issues that come up with triggers and to talk about how to get the most out of the rifle by properly squeezing the trigger. So the last body part that's in motion and one that's actually in motion during the firing process is your trigger finger. Now, When it comes to the placement of your trigger on the finger, it's really important that you only use the tips of the pads. And basically, you want to be able to pull the trigger in a straight line back to your shoulder. What I try to do is I try to picture a straight line through the barrel, through the trigger, into my shoulder. And I try to pull the trigger in a perfectly straight line through the barrel towards me. You have to understand that any side torque on the trigger... So if you're, if you're one of those people that lay your finger along the side of the trigger and pull it or reach in too far, well, you're going to push or pull the rifle during the firing process. So you want to make sure that you have the trigger being pulled straight back in line with the shooter. Also, something really important to touch base on is I don't like your trigger finger touching anywhere else on the stock other than the trigger. So we want a gap between the rest of our finger and the actual trigger itself. It's easier to show you here at the school, but I'm sure you guys can get the picture of what we're talking about. When you get to that first big knuckle on your finger, you want that bent out so that none of that portion of your finger is actually laying alongside or touching the stock. This will actually introduce some movement during the shot. Now, I will tell you that when you're practicing good trigger pull, dry firing is really important. So you want to make sure that the gun is empty if you're going to practice any of this stuff and i will tell you right out of the gate common question we get asked well won't dry firing hurt my rifle or damage the firing pin and the short answer of that is no 
Today's modern bolt action rifles with steel firing pins will withstand hundreds of thousands of dry fires. The exception would be if you have a high speed aluminum firing pin, in which case, yes, they can get damaged over a long period of time of dry firing them. But typically speaking, with our rifles here, no, we want you to be able to dry fire as much as you like without hurting anything. I also want to throw out here some safety stuff. I don't put snap caps in my rifles. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's really a good idea to put anything in it or even resembles ammunition of any kind. Because if you are practicing this technique and you practice it at home, if you put a loaded round in there, if you accidentally have a round in the magazine, you didn't catch it and you close that bolt and you send a round through the basement wall and into the neighbor's house, I will guarantee it, A, your shooting career is over if you're married and you have you know, a wife and family at home. And I will also guarantee that you will not be invited to the neighbors for Christmas. And to go one step further, there's really a good chance that you're going to get a knock on your door and you're going to get a pair of silver bracelets around your wrist and you're going to have a lot of explaining to do. So right out of the gate, this is no area to fall asleep or become lazy in. And this type of stuff, if you get lazy or you become too competent in in doing this type of practicing or you get complacent that's when accidents happen so when i dry fire i make sure that there's no magazine in the gun i work the bullet a couple of times stick my finger in there but you will never see me stick a snap cap in there now the the trick with dry firing and trigger control someone once asked me how much focus is on the trigger and how much focus is on watching the target when you get to that point and you're ready to fire. So we'll have this little mental checklist that we'll go over here at, at the end of the series and sort of try to wrap this all together to make sense. So right now with the series, all we're doing is going through piece by piece, nitpicking all the little parts of fundamentals, and then we're going to put it together in this neat little process that you're going to go through and use in a correct order. I always say that it's not just about fundamentals in its entirety. So fundamentals is this list of things that you have to do as a shooter, but good marksmanship is fundamentals in the correct order, paying attention to the correct things when they're supposed to be paid attention to. If you get fundamentals out of order or you start paying attention to the wrong things at the wrong time, you still can wind up with a bad shot. So let's just say that right out of the gate. So when you're dry firing, what I try to watch is I'm watching my crosshairs and I'm making sure that the only thing that they're doing is shimmering when I break the shot. I don't want the crosshair jumping or launching a little bit left and right or or bouncing. That's telling you that you're building pressure into the rifle and just a simple snap of that trigger and the vibrations being introduced in the gun is allowing it to come out and it's showing you that it's there. So, So someone once asked me how much focus is on your trigger pull and how much focus is on the intended target when you're dry firing. And I, my answer to that is 80-20. So once I get to the point to where I'm actually ready to pull the trigger, 80% of my focus is on drawing a mental straight line through the barrel, through the trigger, straight into my shoulder. 20% is, is just watching the conditions, watching the target. If it's, you know, we're hunting, we make sure that the animal's not jumping up and running away. If it's steel, just paying attention to conditions, making sure that a big gust of wind isn't coming right when I'm trying to break the trigger and get in the shot down range, but it's about 80-20. Now, your trigger placement on the trigger is really important. We want to use the tips of the flats, and here's how I can explain it. I want you to take your trigger finger, and I want you to slide it in and out of the trigger well until you can find this perfectly straight spot across the shoe so that your finger is actually a T to it. So we want to be able to pull the trigger straight to the rear. So you don't want to be pulling off to the the side of the trigger. You want to take your finger, slide it back and forth until you find this nice sweet spot to where the pad of your finger is perfectly square like a T to the trigger itself. Then I want you to picture rolling your right hand, if you're right-handed, up and down. And I want you to try to have your finger perfectly square to the trigger up and down. If you roll your hand down a little bit, your finger will be like a T across the face, flat, and 
in proportion to the face of the trigger will be straight across the trigger, like a straight line being drawn straight across the front of the trigger. Sometimes you roll your wrist down to do that, and that'll create that gap between your trigger finger and the actual stock itself. So roll your wrist down a little bit so you can get the trigger finger itself straight across the face of the trigger in a straight line, and then also that the pad is 90 degrees to the trigger as well. Now, a good trigger pull is a pull that goes off on a snap intentionally. So the hunter that wants to be surprised by squeezing the trigger, squeezing the trigger, and then bang, the gun going off, that doesn't lead to really good consistent shooting. What you should do is put your finger on the trigger, and when you're ready to break the shot, a straight, clean squeeze. So it's going to be a click And then you hold that finger to the rear, hold that trigger to the rear until you either see the bullet hit the target or the animal and you're ready to let go and work the bolt. The reason you don't want to do that little squeeze, 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 bang, surprise thing is because when the gun fires, your finger will bounce off the trigger and it'll be out there moving around the no man's land and the whole time during the firing process. So it takes about 0.03 seconds for your bullet from the firing pin to fall, ignite the primer, send the bullet into the barrel, and out the barrel. Now that's fast, but it's no time for your trigger finger to be out there bouncing around all over the place freely while the bullet is in the barrel. So you've got to hold that trigger finger to the rear during the shot. You have to get in the habit of holding it to the rear intentionally until the bullet gets downrange, hits the target, or you're ready to release and work the bolt. The other thing you have to be really careful of is some people will do this weird let go and come back and hit the trigger quickly. So you'll see their trigger almost like they're resetting an AR-15. Their, their finger will come off slightly, then slam back into the trigger quickly. That's a bad technique as well. Make sure it's a straight, clean pull to trigger. It's really funny at the shooting school while you're watching shooters shoot is they can be doing a lot of these things and have no idea that they're doing it. They're unable to watch themselves shoot. So I don't know a lot of people that actually sit around and record themselves shooting. And so you could be doing all of these crazy things and really not even know that you're doing it. The other thing that gets involved with triggers and good marksmanship is trigger pull weight. I'm going to avoid running down the rabbit hole of talking about weight. This is personal preference. I will tell you that me personally, one and a half to two pounds is great. Two and a half pounds on a hunting rifle is great. I don't think you're going to win any races lowering your trigger pull weight down to bench rest type shooting weight of two to three ounces in a field gun. If anything, I think you leave yourself open to an ND or an AD, accidental or negligent discharge, and ultimately leaving yourself open to having an accident on the firing line, on the hunting trip. So I don't mind a little bit heavier pull weight. You can get used to it. It just feels like a trigger. I do like two-stage triggers. I'm really excited about some of them that are coming out. There's some new ones that are coming on the line that we're getting to check out all the time. So I am a big fan of two-stage. So when you're, when you're on target ready to shoot, finger goes on the trigger, you pull back to the, to the second stage, and you break your shot. I actually like that a lot. And I think partly because my hands are a little bit smaller, I don't have giant hands, so it brings the trigger back closer to, to my grip. Just makes for a really nice clean break. So single stage, two stage, personal preference. One area that I sort of find unique, though, is a lot of times people fall in love with the trigger not because of the name brand. So, for example, you've got lots of different brands to choose from, but the actual trigger shoe itself. Like, for example, the Jewel trigger. Jewel is a great trigger. I personally don't shoot them because I find that the shoe itself is too narrow, and I don't like a narrow shoe. I like to be able to feel that that face of the trigger to get a good 90-degree pull on that, on the face. But a lot of times you'll find yourself hovering to a, a trigger 
because you just like the feel of it. You like the trigger shoe. It's the shoe that you like, whether it's smooth, whether it's, you know, some of them have lines in them or, or like, like grip textured areas. Others are straight. You might find that you just fall in love with a trigger simply because of the shoe design itself. It just fits you well and you like how it, how it works. Another really important part of the trigger that's unspoken of isn't even about the pull weight. It's about the consistency of the pull weight. So this goes hand in hand with not being surprised with the shot going off. I want the shot to go off right when I want it to by a clean, straight squeeze of the trigger. That's really important. Well, how can you do that if your trigger is breaking at 22 ounces on one pull, 26 ounces on the next pull, 21 ounces on the next pull, 25 ounces? So you see where this goes. What I like is a very consistent pull weight. And sometimes this requires a little dance with adjusting the trigger. So, for example, we may have a customer that asks, hey, we want a trigger pull set to... 1.9 1.9 pounds for whatever reason, something very specific. Might be because that's what all of his other rifles are set to. When we install that trigger, we might play with it a little bit. And if it's not breaking exactly 1.9 every time, so let's just say it's breaking at 1.7, 1.9, 1.8, 1.9, 1.7, sometimes just adjusting the trigger either with spring tension, pull weight, a little more, a little less, will allow that trigger to sort of settle in and start breaking at the same pull weight every every time. So might adjust that trigger, and now all of a sudden it's 1.8, 1.9, 1.8, 1.8, 1.9. That is a good trigger. If you can get it to break at 1.8 every time, fantastic. But we just don't want an inconsistent pull weight where it's breaking a little high or low from shot to shot. This is really critical if you plan on attending a moving class or moving targets. If the shot doesn't go off exactly when you want it to, your shot is either going to be in front of the mover or behind it. So if you're going to shoot moving targets, we teach this class in Georgia. I will tell you that trigger pull weight and consistency really makes a huge difference. We're shooting 10-inch balloons in motion out to 1,000 yards. Majority of the training, 300 to 600, but we're going to give it a go out to 1,000. In the very last class we taught, we had two first-round hits, one with a 223 bolt gun at 1,000 yards on a 10-inch balloon moving. If that shot doesn't go off exactly when it's supposed to, you're going to miss. So consistency is really, really key here. Now, I'm not going to go off and name brands and, and recommend this and recommend that because there's a lot of great triggers out there. I will tell you that we are building a lot on the trigger tech now. I think that's a fantastic trigger, easily adjustable by the end shooter, and I like the roller pin design. So it it's, doesn't all have all the other parts moving in there. It also is really tolerable to dirt and debris, which is really important for the type of shooting that we do. For example, in Georgia, it's sand. And so we have some shooting going on around you. It rains on us for half a morning, and next thing you know, your trigger's not working real well. That's not a good thing. And so we look at our equipment saying, A, we want super high quality, but it does have to tolerate being in the field in real-world shooting. And so I really have gravitated towards the trigger tech. I think it's a fantastic trigger for the money. So when we do our next series, we're going to be focusing on what goes sort of hand-in-hand with trigger control, and we're going to touch base on follow-through, and we're going to share with you one of the top three things that I think makes a difference in long-range shooting. So our very next podcast, which will be episode number 25, we're excited about that, is going to continue on from the trigger part to what we consider follow-through, and then I'm going to share with you one of the top three training things that you can do to become the best shooter that you can do. Now, we have some exciting news for the shooting school and some big changes coming up for this fall, and that will continue on from here on out. So the school school itself is, you know, we're getting old. We're well well over a decade old in training, and we're seeing a lot of things coming through that just aren't working for us and and our ability to train the students properly. And so I'm going to share with you a list of things that's pretty common to see, and then I'm going to share with you a lot of the exciting new policies that we've put in place and some changes coming for our shooting school here. 
So we, we run into issues all the time. You know, as hard as we try to cut these off, we try to share tons of information about, you know, the proper equipment to bring the proper ammunition scope. I try to ask lots of questions on the phone, but still we get customers that, that want to bring their own rifle that really don't know if it's up for the job. So they're coming to a, a race car driving school and they don't know, but they're showing up with the family minivan. So it really causes some issues here. And I get it that they want to shoot their own rifle. And, I, you know, the common thing we get asked is, hey, I want to learn my own rifle. But in this type of scenario, I think that's a mistake because the only thing you may learn is the limits of your own equipment. So I tell students this all the time. And at the end of the three days, this is a common thing to say is, oh, my gosh, you know, running the school rifle is the best thing we've ever done. We've learned so much, you know, and we've never had a customer ever in the history of the school regret doing it. Because anything that you learn, you can apply to any rifle you shoot from here on out. But it would really be awful to come through and have a rifle that doesn't give you the opportunity to even learn it. So we find that that sometimes limits the students' abilities because really the only thing that they learn is the limit of their own equipment. I mean, wrong ammunition, inaccuracy. We had customers just ordering ammunition offline and shooting it without ever testing it in the rifles. I give you my my big list here. Another one is just not spending enough time with the rifle to know before it gets here. A huge issue is the wrong scopes. So we have a lot of or a big laundry list of scopes that we won't build on because they're garbage and they are constantly showing up here at the school, chasing zeros, running out of elevation, completely failing. I mean, this, the list goes on and on. Um, another really important thing is the poorly designed stocks on a lot of these factory rifles. Uh, the very last class that we had, we actually changed. We, we were lucky. We actually had an extra stock here in inventory, um, decent Remington 700 and a, a decent scope on it. But the stock was just horrendous, uh, flexing and bowing and moving. And it was just a train wreck. And all we did was change his stock and he was off to the races. So we were able to get him a stock. But this is pretty common. The scope issues, again... Happens all the time. Uh, muzzle brakes. The muzzle brakes are getting horrific. I mean, the names of them say it all. And we teach prone. We teach prone here at the school because I can teach you how to, the rifle is supposed to feel, how it's supposed to act, how you're supposed to sort of work together as a team prone, but I can't teach you that bench. And the problem with prone is we get a, a muzzle brake beside us that has a rearward facing ports and now we're setting rifle cases up between people and we're setting shooting bags you're getting hammered so we're trying to you know deal with that then the safety issues to go along with it from dirt and debris being thrown around to now we have students with earplugs and muffs because the guns are so loud and so it was really funny i was beside a student talking to him louder and louder and louder and so I got to the point where I was actually almost yelling to get to before he heard me because he's double upping because of the brake that's beside him. So there's this whole safety issue that gets involved. So some exciting news is coming up for the school this fall and some new policies are going into place. And we just received an email here from a gentleman from down south. His name was Jim. And I'm going to go over the policies and why we've changed them and Try to really take the school up to the next level as a teaching facility. So right out of the gate, starting here forward, the classes are limited to eight shooters. We do that on purpose. Your average school is at 12. Now, you wouldn't think that, that cutting the school down by a third would be that big of a deal. But if I put it in real numbers and said, hey, do you want me to write you a check for $700,000 or a million? It's a big difference. And so keeping the numbers down here at the school allow us to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with each individual student, addressing everybody's personal wants and needs with efficiency. The problem we've had before with customer-brought rifles was that we wind up with rifles that aren't performing or have all these issues we're trying to figure out at the school. And so we have nine students on the firing line and one or two students are requiring an instructor's attention for the entire first day, leaving the other seven students who came prepared, well, just to say, you know, maybe a little disappointed. 
And so that's not fair to the seven students who showed up prepared for us to lose one of our instructors to spend one-on-one instructions with somebody who didn't take the effort to come to the school properly prepared. So starting right now, moving forward, we are working on being a 100% suppressed firing line. So what that means is we're going to have suppressors here for everybody at the school. And that's for so many reasons. Number one is for safety. It was to the point where I had earmuffs that had electric earmuffs over top of my earplugs so I could turn the volume up on the muffs so I could hear the firing line but still have double protection on my hearing. And that's just getting to be too much. So from here on forward, you know, as one set of earplugs or one set of electric muffs. And by the way, electric muffs only reduce the decibel rating. If you pay attention to this stuff, 26 decibels. Same way with earplugs. A really good set of earplugs put in for the first time is 30 decibels. 30 decibels, even on a suppressed rifle, still takes you down to 100. That's still loud. If you take a muzzle brake redirecting that sound back to you, the shooter, even doubled up, it's probably louder than it should be. So the suppressors are here to reduce the recoil and also just increase the comfort of everybody on the firing line. From the instructors to the students shooting beside each other, I can just give you a list of one and on. We can talk and you can hear us. So from here forward, 100% suppressed firing line. Those students that already signed up for the fall classes, we're letting them slide through. But anyone here forward, it's suppressed. Another policy we're putting in place is that you will use a school rifle. We're going to have five or six school rifles here. And we're doing that for training purposes. A, we get to keep everything the same on the firing line, same calibers. We get to control the ammunition, which has become a problem here at the school. We had somebody bring in factory custom ammunition in the last class and had a squid load and a bolt action rifle, which means it had very little to no powder in it. That's not acceptable. Now, it wasn't his fault. These weren't his hand loads. These were actually manufactured ammunition by a custom ammunition manufacturer. And so we can't have that here. We don't want to have to deal with while we're trying to teach people the art of long-range shooting. The exception to the rule, and this is one I was just explaining to Jim via email, because he had asked, he had a really nice custom rifle. And it was, I think it was a 300 Jarrett is, is what he wanted to bring. And he was intending on going to um, uh, Marco Polo sheep hunt. And I explained to him that there's so many reasons why uh, we're, we're saying, come and learn the art of what we do. Let us teach you the art of driving a rifle with the exception of those who have purchased one of our custom rifles. And it's not us saying, hey, we're going to give favoritism to anyone who's done business with us. And it's not us trying to promote our rifles. The shooting school is designed to teach you to shoot. But it really wouldn't be fair to the customers who have purchased a rifle to rent a twin to what they own here at the school. So the exception that we're making to this rule is that A customer that has purchased one of our rifles in the past may bring it to the school. However, though, they have to be suppressed. And because we've threaded all of these rifles, I feel very confident in putting the suppressor, a school suppressor, on the rifle. So they can rent a suppressor if they don't own one. And they can run that rifle through the course and enjoy their time here at school. But it's for training purposes. We did have a rifle. We were renting suppressors here the last school. And... We had a rifle that was a factory rifle that would not let the suppressor go up to the shoulder. It was it was threaded wrong. And so we don't want to be blowing suppressors off the end of a rifle. And we certainly don't want customers coming in from out of state only to find out they have to rent a school rifle anyway because their threads are off. Or if we measure it, you know, you're going to get a baffle strike so the rifle could steak you. So we're just sort of eliminating that all up front. You know, what we want to do is we want to create a world class school here for the students to come in and learn the art of long range shooting in a very safe, controlled environment to where we can spend time with everybody on the firing line and not constantly be distracted with one student who had brought the wrong equipment either by accident or design. You know, you bring a rifle you haven't, you've never shot and you expect one of the, the instructors to spend the whole first day with you on a one-on-one basis to teach you how to work your rifle or to zero your rifle or to shoot your rifle or to set your scope up because the scope isn't even mounted on it yet. I mean, 
that's not fair to the other students. So we're just eliminating it all together. And our goal is to really just come up with a world-class shooting school. So you can come through and learn the art and enjoy yourself while you're here. And we get to spend a fair amount of time with everybody on the firing line. The school itself, of course, is a level one and two combined. So it's a three-day class. Then we do offer our King of the Mountain, which is held in Seneca Rocks, West Virginia. That's our level three course. That's like Pebble Beach with a rifle. And in that event, you can bring your own rifle. So whether it's ours or whether it's your own personal rifle, at that event, you can bring your own rifle. We don't rent rifles there. Same thing goes with our Moving Target School. If you would like to join us in Georgia for our Moving Target Clinic, We don't rent rifles there. That is a a school designed for you to bring your own rifle and enjoy it there. It's all set up for the event. But at both of those events, you have to be through the school here first so you understand a lot of the fundamentals and how to set the rifle up properly so you're going to get the most from the class itself. Now, I did promise some news here coming up, and we want to give a big shout-out to a Mr. Steve Virch. Now, Steve is a bench rest shooter, and he had just competed in the World Open Benchrest. And Steve took fourth place with one of the new ACE rifles. He missed first place by his last group at 1,000 yards being three inches left of center. So we always say it's like at anything, it's the last shot of the last day. You know, it's these little things at the very end that just separate out, you know, first through 10th place. And the fact that the wind pushed him just as small as three inches left of center took him from first to fourth but regardless congratulations steve steve was shooting a six dasher which is a modified six br and we have three more in process so we're building another one for him now and we have two special custom one-offs that will be available if any customers would like one we have two more we're building and they can be put in either a tactical rifle a hunting rifle or an adventurous rifle i also want to announce that we just released our new carbon fiber rifles we've been working on them for a while We have some proprietary designs for proof research for our carbon fiber barrels. And we just finished up some 18 and a half inch with fully adjustable McMillan Warden carbon fiber stocks. Adjustable length of pull, adjustable cheek piece. These rifles are designed to shoot. Our guest instructor, Mr. Walt Sloyer, has come through. We built his last week. He was shooting it at the range um, before classes. So we were teaching the classroom portion. Walt had taken advantage of a little bit of downtime and ran to the range to test the rifle. It's a hammer. And we're excited to announce that this rifle comes in at just 7 pounds, 13 ounces before the optics. So a very rugged, accurate, real long-range rifle that still comes in under 8 pounds. Fantastic. So we have an 18.5-inch version. We have a couple barrels left for that. And we have some 22-inch barreled versions, which don't add that much more weight because we're only stretching out the barrel in the middle. The ends are exactly the same. So we're excited about that and the weight. So our goal was to try to keep this rifle under 8 pounds, and I think we've managed to pull that off. So I'm pretty excited about that. Now, we did have a question from a customer. His name was Greg, and he was from Clayton Olmsted, Ohio. So we have a customer that had emailed us a question, and I told him I would read it on the air because I thought it was worthwhile talking about. And Greg had asked when it comes to the rifles. His question was, I plan on getting into long-range shooting. I'm hooked. You know, when you get into a new sport, you get into something like this, and the hook usually goes from your lip to your wallet, regardless of whether it's riding motorcycles, shooting archery. I mean, that's usually how it starts. And his question was actually legit. We get this question all the time. And he said... Should I buy a factory rifle and play with it for a while and then upgrade my equipment? Or if I have the means, should I just dive right in and get a custom rifle? Well, with me removing myself as a builder and as a shooter, if you think you're going to take this seriously and you have the means, make sure that you know, you're not taking away from any other part of your life that's super important. But if you have the means to do it, absolutely get a real great shooting rifle right out of the gate. You always want your rifle to be able to outperform you. When you start out shooting your equipment or your equipment becomes the weakest link in the system, you stop learning. And so if you want to become a great shooter and you have the means, 
by all means, get the best equipment that you can afford. Because you're going to learn so much more, so much more faster. You're going to be less frustrated if the rifle is not performing or if that flyer out there was you or the rifle or if you question it. So you're at the range practicing and you get a couple flyers here and there. If you let that get in your head that, oh my gosh, I wonder if it's my equipment, if it's my scope, all of that stuff, it's just a downhill spiral from there. And so having that utmost confidence in your equipment, if you shank a shot, that's just me. You know, I must have pulled that one. You don't let it get in your head. You don't, you don't question your equipment. You'll just keep driving on. So my answer would be unbiasedly, yes. I absolutely think if you can afford to go custom that you should. I think making sure that you get what you're paying for, you know, just be real careful because just because it's a custom rifle doesn't mean it shoots all that much better than factory. We can tell you that from experience here at the school. But as long as you do your research and make sure that you're getting the quality that you're paying for, absolutely. There's there's no sense not to because you're just going to enjoy it that much more. It, that's what it's supposed to be all about. So for 2019, uh, we'll be wrapping up this fall with two more classes for the shooting school. Next year, we'll only be holding seven shooting school classes, two advanced classes in Seneca, one moving target class, meaning 10 classes for the year. We will be posting up our dates for next year's classes sometime in August, so keep an eye out if you need to schedule some vacation and time off to get here. Of course, we'd love to have you and excited to see you. If you get a chance, we would also like to ask for those of you that have listened to the podcast here or that those that have attended the shooting school, if you wouldn't mind, you know, logging in and leaving some feedback, uh, liking us on Facebook or sharing some of the information that we talk about. We certainly here really, really do appreciate it, you know, passing it on. We enjoy all you know, the opportunity to, to talk to everybody and to share all the information that we share here. And we really are thankful for you guys that are listening. So the next podcast we're going to be talking about, we're going to continue on with our series on fundamentals. It's going to be a bi-weekly process. So every other week we're going to be releasing a new podcast simply because we're full on in build season. The next podcast is going to continue on our series of fundamentals of marksmanship in which we're going to talk about follow through. And we're going to go into one of my top three things that I think every shooter should know when it comes to practicing. So if you ask me, Jamie, skip all the BS in the middle and tell me what three things will make a big difference, the next podcast is going to include one of those three things. So I'm excited to share that with you. So thank you for taking the time for joining us. My name is Jamie Dotson. I'm your host, and you're listening to Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. (laughs) 